Thank you all for joining us for our ongoing series of schematics. Tonight, we're going to be going through a, a rather brief poem, The Gods of the Copybook Headings by Rudyard Kipling. Uh, Kipling is a fascinating author uh, in particular because he was part of the British dysphoria. He was actually born in India. And so his outlook is one that is colored by being part of the broader British colonial endeavor and not growing up actually in England. Uh, many of his um, stories that he writes are colored by this and the poems that he composes. He was a champion of colonialism. Now, colonialism has developed a very bad reputation, but when you look at it, the enterprise of spreading Western civilization around the world was on the whole a good thing everywhere it went. Now, that does not mean every Westerner who went everywhere was good. And it does not mean that everything even good people did were good. Um, people are a mixture. But you look at um, the Americas, for example, and before the conquistadors overtook uh, what is now Mexico, the Aztecs were slaughtering thousands of people to dedicate their new temple uh, because they believed in human sacrifice. Or with Kipling's experience in India. Can you imagine that India was a better place when a man would die, his wife would be taken and thrown alive on his funeral pyre and burned? Um, obviously, Western civilization has been a, a great blessing. Uh, as a side note, in the time that we've spent in South Korea, it's very intriguing to talk with the people there because they have no sense of having been oppressed by Western culture because the, Koreas, the Koreans had been essentially enslaved by the Japanese for decades before they were liberated and so they view Western culture as a great liberation and have no feeling of being imposed upon. But Kipling was a champion of colonialism. And yet he saw many problems with especially the arrogance of the British as they reigned over the world. Uh, it's hard for us to imagine but uh, Victoria was the monarch who reigned over more land mass and more of humanity than anyone before. You look at it and fully half of the population of the world, over half, were British subjects under Victoria and it was a quarter of the entire world's landmass. When you look at India, over half of Africa, all of Canada, Australia, it, it was amazing. And yet, Kipling saw that and saw that human arrogance inevitably would lead to destruction. He was a critic of pretense. Anything that he saw that was for show and not of substance, he would call it out. And so he does in his poem, The Gods of the Copybook Heading. We'll read through the poem once and then we'll go back over it and look at what he says. And then we'll go through it a last time, perhaps with more understanding. This was written, by the way, in uh, 1919. Uh, Kipling's son had died not too long before in the First World War. And this perhaps provided some of 
his sober thoughts about Western culture. He writes, as I pass through my incarnations in every age and race, I make my proper prostrations to the gods of the marketplace. Peering through reverent fingers, I watch them flourish and fall. And the gods of the copybook heading, I notice outlast them all. We were living in trees when they met us. They showed us each in turn that water would certainly wet us as fire would certainly burn. But we found them lacking in uplift, vision and breadth of mind. So we left them to teach the gorillas while we followed the march of mankind. We moved as the spirit listed, they never altered their pace. Being neither cloud nor windborne like the gods of the marketplace, but they always caught up with our progress and presently word would come that a tribe had been wiped off its ice field or the lights had gone out in Rome. With the hopes that our world is built on, they were utterly out of touch. They denied that the moon was Stilton. They denied he was even Dutch. They denied that wishes were horses. They denied that a pig had wings. So we worshiped the gods of the market who promised these beautiful things. When the Cambrian measures were forming, they promised perpetual peace. They swore if we gave them our weapons that the wars of the tribes would cease. But when we disarmed, they sold us and delivered us bound to our foe. And the gods of the copybook heading said, stick to the devil, you know. On the first feminine sandstones, we were promised the fuller life, which started by loving our neighbor and ended by loving his wife. Till our women had no more children and the men lost reason and faith. And the gods of the copybook heading said the wages of sin is death. In the Carboniferous epoch, we were promised abundance for all by robbing selected Peter to pay for collective Paul. But though we had plenty of money, there was nothing our money could buy. And the gods of the copybook heading said, if you don't work, you die. Then the gods of the market tumbled and their smooth tongues wizard withdrew. And the hearts of the meanest were humbled and began to believe it was true. That all is not gold that glitters and two and two make four. And the gods of the copybook headings limped up to explain it once more. As it will be in the future, it was at the birth of man. There are only four things certain since social progress began. That the dog returns to his vomit and the sow returns to her mire and the burnt fool's bandage finger goes wobbling back to the fire. And that after this is accomplished and the brave new world begins when all men are paid for existing and no man must pay for his sins. As surely as water will wet us, as surely as fire will burn, the gods of the copybook headings with terror and slaughter return. The purpose of our meetings in schematics is to trace the outline of life and culture, looking at various texts from a Christian perspective. And as we look at this, we come to the idea of the copybook heading. Now, I'm old enough to remember when one learned to write in print and then in cursive, and there would be an exemplar, and you would write over and over a line. Now, unfortunately, by the time I was doing this, the moral impetus of the copy book had been removed. But it used to be through the 17, 1800s and into the 20th century, 
that the lines that the students would copy would be proverbs that would help them in life so that they would be internalizing truths. Henry Ford mentions this in his book, Ford Ideals. He writes, most of the wisdom of the world was in the copybooks, the lines we used to write over and over again, the homely old maxims on which we practice to obtain legibility of our P's and Q's were the essence of human wisdom. Whenever we look at this, we see the importance of the accumulated wisdom that has been stored up as the common heritage of mankind. And as George Santayana indicated, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So let's go through Kipling's poem, section by section, and we'll see what he had to say. And it's interesting because bear in mind, this was written in the early part of the 20th century, but so much that he was seeing was prescient and reaches to us today. He begins, as I pass through my incarnations in every age and race, I make my proper prostrations to the gods of the marketplace. Now he's not teaching incarnation or any kind of Eastern mysticism, but rather he's using this as an image for every man. That all people, when you look at all time, there is a common humanity that can be found. But we find in this also that he was a man of his time. He says, I make my proper prostrations to the gods of the marketplace. That is to say, he was attuned to the sensitivities of his day and he would fit in in his society although he was willing to step outside of it and to be its critic as well. C.S. Lewis observed, every age has its own outlook. It is especially good at seeing certain truths and especially liable to make certain mistakes. For those who have lived any length of time, you can think back when our society was very much uh, out of step with our sensitivities today. And yet, we see things that have changed that are not altogether for the good. Kipling continues, peering through reverent fingers, I watched them flourish and fall, and the gods of the copybook headings I notice outlast them all. We were living in trees when they met us. They showed us each in turn that water would certainly wet us as fire would certainly burn. So there are basic principles that even in the most primitive of settings that people would know. We began our series of schematics with Landon's presentation on the abolition of man. And in that brief book, C.S. Lewis points out that there are common threads that run through all cultures, that if people believe in transcendent law, it's amazing how similar it will be, no matter where you live, whether you're talking about the most advanced cultures or the most primitive, there are just basic truths that keep returning. And yet, Kipling was concerned that people were not satisfied with these basic truths. He says, but we found them lacking in uplift, vision and breadth of mind. So we left them to teach the gorillas while we followed the march of mankind. The idea that the current age is somehow much more advanced in every respect from the ages that have gone before is a common mistake that has been around really since the age of enlightenment, of the French enlightenment of Voltaire and Rousseau. The idea that the previous age was the dark age 
and they are the age of enlightenment. And this idea really fits into a notion that really laid hold on all of Western thought in the 1800s, and that is the concept of evolution. The idea that hum the humanity is always moving from a more primitive and less worthy setting to a more ennobled one. The problem is you begin looking and the concept of progress is really hard to sustain. Are people really more moral today than they were a hundred years ago? Is the quality of life, not in material goods or technological advances, but in terms of how people live day to day, is it truly better? And yet Kipling said, we have followed the gods of the marketplace. By the way, this is not a critique of capitalism. It is not talking about the marketplace in the sense of uh, Adam Smith, the wealth of nations, but rather marketplace as in the marketplace of ideas. Um, the agora of the ancient world was the marketplace, but it was also where philosophers would go. Whenever Paul went to Mars Hill, that was both a place of conversation and it was a place of interaction of, of uh, buying and selling. The gods of the marketplace promised progress. We moved as the spirit listed. They never altered their pace, being neither cloud nor windborne like the gods of the marketplace. So the gods of the copybook heading, the principles that are found as a basis of all society, they don't change. They stay steady. But those driven by the spirit of the age are being windborne. They're like clouds. And this picture of theorists promising a better life goes back a long way. In the fifth century before Christ, there was a playwright in Athens called Aristophanes. And two of my favorite uh, of his work, I do like the frogs as well, but the birds and the clouds. In the birds, the birds come and try to persuade people to establish a new um, utopia called Cloud Cuckoo Land that would be floating in the air in between the gods and mankind. And this expression, Cloud Cuckoo Land, has come into parlance. It's been used by various philosophers to describe the idea of a utopia that can't exist that's just up in the clouds. And in Aristophanes' work, The Clouds, he lampooned Socrates. And by the way, it was at a time when Socrates was not all that well known. He was just beginning his career as a, a great thinker. And so in, when this was performed in Athens, the crowd was whispering, who is this Socrates? And, Socrates heard it, so he stood up and said, here I am. And by the way, um, they also record of Socrates that when he was being uh, lampooned in this play, that he laughed more heartily than anyone. But in this play, Socrates was the head of a, uh, a, a think tank called the Thinkery. And they were involved in determining wonderful things. For example, they devised a method for measuring how far a flea can jump by getting a wax cast of a foot of a flea and then laying it out. Such wonderful knowledge in the thinkery. But the idea that area uh, concepts, theories are going to bring about a wonderful life well, the gods of the marketplace were not there, but they were never far behind. The gods 
excuse me, the gods of the copybook heading were not there. The gods of the copybook heading were never far removed. They were always there. And for that reason, even though mankind was fascinated with these airy ideas, the gods of the copybook heading would catch up, but they always caught up with our progress. And presently, word would come that a tribe had been wiped off its ice field or the lights had gone out in Rome. Well, you think about a primitive tribe up in the Arctic dying off. Well, okay, but Rome. We have a hard time understanding what psychological importance the fall of Rome in 410 was. Rome had been called the eternal city. It was the center of an empire that stretched from Great Britain all the way to what is now uh, Iran. All of the Mediterranean, in fact, the Mediterranean Sea was called a Roman lake. And then Rome fell. And it caused a pause. What had happened? By the way, it was also the occasion for Christian intellectual uh, tradition to be developed. Augustine wrote his book, The City of God, as an explanation that the eternal city is really not a political military city but rather it's the ideal of the reign of God in the lives of men. But in spite of the gods of the copybook heading catching up occasionally, of tribes being wiped off their ice field and even Rome falling, people still wanted the illusion promised by the gods of the marketplace. The gods of the copybook heading were out of touch with the hopes that our world is built on. They were utterly out of touch. They denied that the moon was Stilton. They denied she was even Dutch. They denied that wishes were horses. They denied that a pig had wings. So we worship the gods of the market who promised these beautiful things. People get caught up in delusions. This was first identified in a clear way by a Scottish commentator, Charles Mackay, who wrote a book with the title, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. You can look through history and there have been times where popular culture has gotten caught up with an idea. Uh, sometimes it's an economic fad. Um, in Holland, there was tulip mania, where people began buying and selling tulip, tulip bulbs to the point that with one bulb for an extraordinary tulip, you could easily buy a large farm. But the tulip bubble burst, and the people who had heavily invested in that were <laughs> greatly disappointed. Are delusions that have a very sinister uh, background. We think in our own country of the Salem witch trials, where in Massachusetts, people really believed that the devil had come in and taken hold of certain individuals. They had sold their souls to him, that they were witches and that they were a danger and had to be executed and people died. We think in terms in the 20th century of national socialism in Germany. And you think about Germany, no country in the world was more advanced in its education, its supposed sophistication, and yet they went from the monarchy of the Kaiser to the Weimar Republic to national socialism in short order and it's fascinating because the intellectuals in Germany did not, on the whole, oppose Hitler. The religious leaders in Germany did not, on the whole, oppose him. 
He was phenomenally popular until the war began turning against him. The madness of crowds. So do pigs have wings and are wishes horses? Well, if you don't agree with those, you'll be out of step and people will look askance at you. Kipling continues. When the Cambrian measures were forming, uh, this is a dig at Cambridge, one of the two great universities of Britain. The intellectuals who claimed that they could recast the world. When the Cambrian measures were forming, they promised perpetual peace. They swore if we gave them our weapons, then the wars of the tribes would cease. Remember, his son had just died in the First World War, that the American president, Woodrow Wilson, had promised would be the war that would end all wars. And then you look through the rest of the 20th century. By the way, the fact that Kipling was noting this in 1919 is very interesting. But the promise, well, you just give up all your weapons and everything's going to be all right. Here's the question. Why do people on the whole have weapons? Most people are not criminals. Most civilized nations are not aggressors. So why not just give up all the weapons? Well, why did you have them in the first place? It was for peace, for protection. They swore if we gave them our weapons that the wars of the tribes would cease. But when we disarmed, they sold us and delivered us bound to our foe. And the gods of the copybook heading said, stick to the devil, you know. On the first Viminian sandstones, we were promised the fuller life. Uh, this is the idea of feminism that was arising, the obliteration of the distinction between men and women. If you'll think back to the turn of the last century, especially in England, but also in sophisticated areas of the United States, women began to wear men's clothing, or they would wear clothing that had been fashioned to look very much like a man's. And the idea that the nuclear family really was not all that important. In our country, we found the great revolution would come later in the 1960s. Um, we have, of course, uh, famously, the summer of love out in San Francisco. They promised a fuller life which started by loving our neighbor and ended by loving his wife. It's interesting, divorce, no fault divorce, actually was signed into law. The first state to do that was California. It was Governor Ronald Reagan who signed that into law. And step-by-step, step, it went through every state of the union but it was interesting, the very last state to legalize no-fault divorce was New York. And the reason for that is the feminist figured out that women were the ones being hurt more by easy divorce than the men. That it was the women who bore the brunt of this and yet they had let the genie out of the bottle and there was no stopping it. Whenever you have a breakdown of the nuclear family, of the laws governing human sexuality and the home, you find that people are hurt by it. There is a reason that people have sanctified marriage, not only in the biblical line of thought, but in all places. 
the idea of any man taking any woman at any time, that does not work out. And in all societies, that has been a taboo. But as this fuller life comes forward, we find a result. Till our women had no more children. It's amazing. Kipling saw this in the early 20th century. And today, most European nations have been at a population deficit for years. In our country, if it were not for immigration, we would be at a population deficit. Whenever the home is abandoned, whenever the procreation of children is not viewed as a noble thing, we're going to stop having children and the future is in jeopardy. Till our women had no more children and the men lost reason and faith and the gods of the copybook heading said, the wages of sin is death. He moves on in the Carboniferous epoch. And I have to admit, when I was studying this initially, I was reading into this modern notions of carbon and carbon fuels. I was close, but no cigar. Kipling was referring to coal miners, and in particular, the fact that they were the ones who fueled the socialist agenda in the early 20th century in Great Britain. So what he's describing here is socialism. In the Carboniferous epoch, we were promised abundance for all by robbing selected Peter to pay for collective Paul. It was Gerald Ford who made the observation the government that is big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take away everything you have. Or Senator Taft of Ohio made the observation that you could enslave a person just as effectively by taxing what he has earned as you can by putting him in chains. So rob the selective Peter. So decide that these people ought to be paying more so that I can have the things I want. But how does that work? Well, you know, you want to spend more, you can always just print more money. And Kipling saw that. You just print more money. But though we had plenty of money, there was nothing our money could buy. I have a coin, perhaps you can see it on the screen. It's a 5 million mark coin that was issued during the Weimar Republic. Uh, inflation was so rampant that you literally would have to have a wheelbarrow full of printed money in order to buy a loaf of bread. Uh, this has happened to other places in Zimbabwe. Whenever the evils of colonialism were abolished, there was abundance for all. Everybody had plenty of money, but with trillions of dollars in money, you could not go to the store and buy anything. It was worthless. But though we had plenty of money, there was nothing our money could buy. And the gods of the copybook heading said, if you don't work, you die. The Apostle Paul makes that same observation. If a man will not work, let him not eat. So in the course of this, we find that all these theories just don't work out. And the history of any time that social engineering has been tried since the days of the Enlightenment, whether you're talking about the French Revolution or whether you're talking about the days of communism with the mass starvation, 
when you ignore the basic principles that you have to produce in order for a society to survive, it won't work out. And so it is. Then the gods of the market tumbled and their smooth tongue wizards withdrew and the hearts of the meanest were humbled and began to believe it was true. That all is not gold that glitters and two and two make four. So repeatedly, you have a turn. Um, there's a saying that every revolution reaches its thermidor that comes from the French Revolution where they went to extremes and then in the month that they called thermidor in the midst of the summer, the tide turned. So you find that eventually the Berlin Wall had to fall. Eventually, even Maoist China had to give up communism. They're not really a communist economy, although they're a dictatorial state, because there are certain principles that you have to follow. And the gods of the copybook heading limped up to explain it once more. As it will be in the future, it was at the birth of man, there are only four things certain since social progress began that the dog returns to his vomit and the sow returns to her mire and the burnt fool's bandaged finger goes wabbling back to the fire. And after this is accomplished and the brave new world began, when all men are paid for existing and no man must pay for his sins, uh, the brave new world. You may remember that Aldous Huxley wrote a dystopian novel with this title. This is where he got it. Kipling identified the utopia that can't exist, that always ends in destruction as the brave new world. When all men are paid for existing, have you ever heard of the idea of a guaranteed universal income? The idea that you're gonna be paid just to exist. And as long as you are content in living in a very meager government house and being on your guaranteed government internet and being fed all the programming they want to feed you, you can eat, you can go out and buy beer, you can live that life, but is that a life worth living? When all men are paid for existing and no man must pay for his sins, we are seeing in our country a tremendous push to remove consequences. We are seeing criminals released and the idea that, well, there should not be bail anymore. People should just be released no matter what. And they should not receive stiff penalties if they're penalized at all. Now, I happen to be a, a strong proponent of penal reform, and I do believe that that is something we should be in a compassionate way looking at. But there is a sense in which whenever a child is killed by a drive-by shooter, whenever a person cannot walk down the streets of our major cities. You know, when I was a child, in elementary school, I could go from my house down to West End Avenue, and I lived way out in the suburbs, and I could get on a bus unaccompanied, give the bus driver a quarter, and I could go all the way down to downtown Nashville, right on the river. And I could walk around in all the places on Music Row and I'll, I would no more do that today than things have changed. We've got to recognize when you remove punishment for wrongdoing, you're ultimately penalizing those who do well. As surely as water will wet us, as surely as fire will burn, the gods of the copybook headings with terror and slaughter return. 
So let's look at some Christian application. First of all, the need for humility. This is true personally, but it's also true culturally. We must recognize that the people who have gone before probably knew some things. And the very idea that a handful of us, the elite, or as Thomas Sowell refers to them as the anointed one, he has a delightful book called The Vision of the Anointed. Because elitism is rampant in our culture, the idea that a handful of self-proclaimed experts can tell everyone what they ought to be doing. Uh, this, by the way, came to the forefront in the recent uh, governor's race in Virginia, where the candidate, one of the candidates, was asked about parents being involved in the school board meetings. And his response was, no, the parents have no business saying what children should be taught that that should be left to the experts. Well, the problem is we live in a democracy and when you're counting votes, there are more mothers of children who care about their children than there are experts who are going to vote. And even though he should have demographically won that election, it cost him because it doesn't really matter what your background is, I'm going to tell you Whenever mothers feel that their children are being disadvantaged, they will rise up. But there needs to be humility. Humility to recognize that we don't have all the answers and we can't make a perfect world. We can't go to war to end all wars. We can't construct an economy where everyone is in the top 1%. Remember Lake Wobegon. Lake Wobegon was a place where all the kids were above normal. They were all better than, better than average. It can't happen. So we need to have humility and we need to have respect for moral order. Again, referring back to C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man, the realization that human beings are not machines, that we are not creatures like a cow in the field, but we are made in the image of God, and that gives us great dignity. It also gives us great responsibility. We are to be moral people. And perhaps most of the point of this, a measured view of history. First of all, we should realize that there are lessons to be drawn from history, but we also have to recognize that just because there's a current trend doesn't mean that the outcome is foreordained. You know, sometimes you'll hear someone saying about their opponent, well, you're on the wrong side of history. Well, you don't know that until history's over. Now as Christians, we do have some insight. We know how human history began and we know how it is going to end. So we can see something of a flow in history. But we must be very careful that we never get caught up in human events to the point that we think things have to have a certain outcome. It was interesting, I mentioned at the beginning that Kipling was a great champion of colonialism, but even in the late 1800s at the height of British imperial power and prestige, he said, this is rotten in the core and it's all going to tumble. He was saying that before the First World War. 
He was saying that at Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. And who would have believed it? But it only took one lifetime. And the British Empire, as they knew it, was no more. So we have to realize that our country, maybe it will last another 200 years. Maybe it won't. But it won't last forever. And that what will last forever, as Augustine pointed out, is not the eternal city of imperial Rome, but the Lord's reign. Let's go through it one more time, and then we'll see if you have any questions. As I pass through my incarnations in every age and race, I make my proper prostrations to the gods of the marketplace. Peering through reverent fingers, I watch them flourish and fall, and the gods of the copybook headings, I notice, outlast them all. We were living in trees when they met us. They showed us each in turn that water would certainly wet us as fire would certainly burn. But we found them lacking in uplift, vision, and breadth of mind. So we left them to teach the gorillas while we followed the march of mankind. We moved as the spirit listed. They never altered their pace, being neither cloud nor windborne like the gods of the marketplace. But they always caught up with our progress and presently word would come that a tribe had been wiped off its ice field or the lights had gone out in Rome. With the hopes that our world was built, they were utterly out of touch. They denied that the moon was Stilton. They denied she was even Dutch. They denied that wishes were horses. They denied that a pig had wings. So we worshiped the God of the market who promised these beautiful things. When the Cambrian measures were forming, they promised perpetual peace. They swore if we gave them our weapons that the wars of the tribes would cease. But when we disarmed, they sold us and delivered us bound to our foe. And the gods of the copybook headings said, stick to the devil you know. On the first Fimian sandstones, we were promised the fuller life which started by loving our neighbor and ended by loving his wife. Till our women had no more children and the men lost reason and faith and the gods of the copybook heading said, the wages of sin is death. In the Carboniferous epoch, we were promised abundance for all by robbing selected Peter to pay for collective Paul. But though we had plenty of money, there was nothing our money could buy. And the gods of the copybook headings said, if you don't work, you die. Then the gods of the market tumbled and their smooth tongued wizards withdrew. And the hearts of the meanest were humbled and began to believe it was true. That all is not gold that glitters and two and two make four. And the gods of the copybook headings limped up to explain it once more. As it will be in the future, so it was at the birth of man. There are only four things certain since social progress began. That the dog returns to his vomit and the sow returns to her mire. And the burnt fool's bandaged finger goes wabbling back to the fire. And after this is accomplished and the brave new world begins, when all men are paid for existing and no man must pay for his sins. As surely as water will wet us, as surely as fire will burn, the gods of the copybook heading with terror and slaughter return. Clavon, what have we left on the table? I guess I'm, I'm impressed with not just... Uh, Kipling, but others who really are able to see uh, the, the root problems with philosophies and, and social uh, trends and things like that. And for him to, you know, almost predict, but to him it wasn't predicting, it was just this is the natural outcome of these philosophies. And, and sometimes I think we, uh, we fail to realize that the natural outcomes of God's philosophies are going to be for our good and our blessings. And we get caught up and distracted and, 
can move towards what our society is doing instead of uh, what God's word, what obviously God tells us to do. Peter, what do you think? Beautiful and depressing at the same time. <laughs> Tonight, I shall not sleep. But I want to ask a question. I've wondered about this for a long time. Are certain people blessed to do certain things in history? For instance, Thomas Edison created the light bulb. Um, many people have created things to advance society. Was Kipling blessed in order to provide such a work that is a hundred years so applicable? There's a, there's a principle found in the book of James that every good and perfect gift is from above. Now that is not merely a reference to those who are personally Christian, but it's a recognition that every good thing is from God. And one of the lessons that we have in our understanding of the flow of human history is that as as the old spiritual says, he's got the whole world in his hands. And that means ultimately we can't, we can't say that God has opened this door and I'm going to go through it. But what I can say is that to the extent that I am walking in accordance with his law, even if my circumstances do not seem good, I will be blessed. Uh, so the question of Kipling, well, first of all, Kipling was informed by a, a biblical faith. He certainly was a student of the Bible, and he believed in the basic principles of Christianity. He would not be someone with whom we would be in fellowship, and yet that was shaping his mind. And certainly, whenever you find anyone who is a serious thinker, who has humbled himself before the principles of scripture, you will find that that person will provide insight. And so the answer is, yes, I, I do believe that every good gift, ultimately, even the light bulb, we can thank God for that. Uh, although on starry nights when I want to look at the heavenly bodies and all the ambient light around me. I, I'm not sure it's, it's an unmixed blessing. <laughs> Landon, any thoughts before we close out? Yeah, um, I liken this to how people would view sci-fi, written uh, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. Uh, if someone were to write a book that would explain modern vehicles and electric cars and interstate system, airplanes and rocket ships and satellites. We would look at that in just awe as a society that someone would see just these kernels of technology in their own time and, and predict out what it would be and think how they would be either lucky or genius. Um, yet we see writings like this and the poem and you had quoted Abolition of Man or spoke of it a few times. Uh, Abolition of Man was similar and the timeline that it was written in was significantly before uh, the social progressions of our day, but it's almost in that sense of uh, eerily accurate sci-fi, where their writings are entirely present in our world today, and the logical conclusions that they pull from, uh, from the social progressions and what they hold to believe as the actual truth of the world, uh, we just, we see both of those growing further and further apart and all of those conclusions coming true. And, and so I think it's sad that while the world can look at an accurate sci-fi and be impressed by it, the world largely chooses to ignore things like the gods of the copy book um, And so that's why I'm so glad that we're talking about it uh, in, in our discussion group here and, and trying to stay on the forefront, uh, staying ahead of the eight ball on, on this type of discussion. Well, it is interesting and I do believe that as Christians, we need to be engaging across the board uh, in culture. And that's been really the point behind our schematic study. The idea that there's an outline of life and culture 
and that we can address that. Um, and I see it on two fronts. First of all, we need to sharpen our minds to talk about these things so that we can speak to the age in which we live. There is an evangelistic element to this. To be able to share the gospel, we must understand the world in which we live. And then secondly, we ourselves need to realize that we are creatures of our age. As much as we would like not to be, we are being influenced by the culture in which we live. And the only way to remain faithful is to be willing to take a step back and to look at the assumptions that are being made and to ask, how does this square with the word of God? Because that's the ultimate standard. Well, I appreciate you all being here. We're going to meet back in a couple of weeks. And our study for that class will be existentialism and human emotion. Clavon? I have one other question. I forgot yes. about it. The um, reference, um, just wondering if you know, uh, I'm assuming you do, the reference with the moon, uh, the Dutch. Oh, it's just the Stilton or whatever that word. Stilton. Uh, that's cheese. It's just, it's just the oh. two moves. Haven't, you've heard about the moon being made out of blue cheese. Oh, <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, the, the, the Dutch is, uh, the, the, the Dutch make great cheese. Um, and of course, you know uh, where cheese is mentioned in the Bible, the tree of the knowledge of Gouda and Edom. Oh. I thought it was blessed are the cheesemakers. The cheesemakers, the cheesemakers. <laughs> Well, very good. Clavon, if you'll close us out with a prayer.